Hello and welcome to our Cardiology Grand Rounds from the DeBakey Studios. I'm Dr. William Zogby, Chair of Cardiology here at Houston Methodist. And it's a pleasure to have a very distinguished speaker with us today, Dr. Fausto Pinto. Dr. Pinto does not need any introduction. Uh, he's world famous for his contributions in cardiology. And on a personal note, a very dear friend over many, many years. As you know, Dr. Pinto is currently the president of the World Heart Federation, uh, a very prestigious uh, and honorary uh, position that he has held. And he is the dean of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Lisbon in Portugal. He's professor of cardiology and head of the cardiology and heart and vascular department at the University Hospital Santa Maria in Lisbon. He is president of the Cardiovascular Center of the University of Lisbon. Dr. Pinto has uh, served in so many distinguished positions. He was past president of the European Society of Cardiology. He also was president of the Councils of Deans, of the Portuguese Medical School. And he was president and founder of the European Association of Echocardiography that actually we interact with in so many years initially known as EuroEcho, but uh, nowadays is certainly a, a global organization uh, which we are very uh, proud to interact with. He has received many awards, among which probably among the most prestigious are the gold medal of the European Society of Cardiology. He is member of the Portuguese Academy of Medicine and probably among the most distinguished cardiologists who've received so many awards from many countries, and I counted them, more than 23 countries, from France, China, Brazil, United States, and for so many contributions that he's done over the years. Um, he's the, uh, he has served as editor-in-chief of the Portuguese Journal of Cardiology, as, and his interests, uh, starting with echocardiography at the beginning, but certainly in heart failure, atrial fibrillation, anticoagulation, and most recently, global health. And I think uh, this is where his contributions as of late have been through his presidency of the World Heart Federation. And today, he will talk to us about how does the World Heart Federation uh, impact global health, particularly in cardiovascular disease, which, as you probably know, is uh, the you know, most important uh, killer and, uh, and factor in morbidity uh, for the population in general globally in the world. And who best to speak to us about this is uh, Dr. Pinto as president of the World Heart Federation. Fausto, uh, what a pleasure having you today. I know you're in Lisbon. We wished we have you here, um, you know, face to face and interacting with us in Houston. Um, I know <laughs> this will happen at some point in time, <laughs> but uh, till then, uh, we welcome your input in so many ways and interactions, you know, through newer modalities, including the web and, uh, and such. So uh, the floor is yours, Fausto. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Bill, for uh, such a nice introduction. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, the invitation. It's an honor uh, to give this uh, Grand Rounds uh, conference at your very prestigious institution. Uh, and it's, uh, it's really uh, fantastic uh, to share this uh, with you. We know each other for a long time. You've been one of uh, the pillars, one of the great contributors for cardiology at the global level. And it's really a big pleasure, a big honor to uh, share this today with you and all the colleagues that are uh, watching this, uh, uh, this presentation. I will be uh, talking uh, a little bit about the role of uh, the World Heart Federation, uh, which uh, I will tell you a little bit about it, which I have also the honor of uh, uh, presiding uh, uh, for this uh, couple of years. And uh, to give you a little bit of uh, um, some details on some of the different uh, activities, the different projects, the different areas where the World Health Federation uh, is working and uh, uh, how much that has been achieved and how much uh, we're still looking uh, forward into the future uh, to uh, achieve and to develop uh, strategies to implement programs that can be really important for the future of uh, cardiovascular health. 
this is my hospital in Lisbon. It's uh, uh, the university hospital. Uh, it's the largest hospital in the uh, in the country, and uh, we always very much uh, uh, welcoming colleagues from all over the world. And uh, it's uh, it's a real delight uh, when we can share that uh, with uh, with other colleagues. But let me tell you a little bit about the World Heart Federation. Uh, some of you, particularly in the cardiovascular field, may be aware of this organization. It's an umbrella organization. It represents the global cardiovascular community and the, its members, they work uh, to achieve the goal, the very ambitious goal, of course, of cardiovascular health for everyone. And we are dealing with the number one killer. Cardiovascular disease is still the world's biggest killer, even now during the pandemic that uh, we are all still living in. Most of the premature deaths due to cardiovascular disease, however, they could be avoided. About 80% of deaths related with cardiovascular disease, they are premature and uh, they will be preventable if we would use the uh, correct ways and the correct measures and the correct knowledge that we already have is just a matter on how we can be successful in implementing these strategies. Over 18.6 million people die every year globally due to cardiovascular disease. One in six aged uh, 15 to 49 years old die from cardiovascular disease, which represents about one third of all deaths at the global level. So as being the umbrella organization, it's also very relevant, the role of WHF as uh, having an official relation with the World Health Organization, representing the cardiovascular community. It's actually the official link uh, for cardiovascular issues uh, with WHO. And that's also the reason why we are based in Geneva in Switzerland, where WHO uh, is also based. We defined when uh, we started uh, uh, our board and uh, my mandate uh, uh, in 2019, we defined the strategic goals for the uh, WHF, there are four main goals. One of them is to become the recognized and credible reference for global cardiovascular health. The second, to promote and support cardiovascular prevention and control at the global level, together with some of uh, the other coalitions, uh, such as the Global Coalition for Circulatory Health, which involves 10 different organizations dealing with uh, issues uh, related uh, with, with circulatory issues like uh, diabetes, uh, uh, hypertension, and nephrology, and so on, and the NCD Alliance, the, the Non-Communicable Disease and, uh, Alliance, through the development of advocacy and communication strategies towards the implementation of the Sustained Development Goal 3.4, which is, as you know, to reduce by 33% primitive mortality by cardiovascular disease by 2030. The third pillar is to mobilize and strengthen the capacity of WHF members to complement, support, and add value to national policies towards this goal of reducing cardiovascular primitive mortality. And finally, to strengthen the organizational growth, membership, transparency, and sustainability to enable WHF to achieve uh, its mission. Uh, we work together very closely with WHO as being the only non-governmental organization in official relations. And uh, we are a platform that convenes both scientific societies like the American College of Cardiology or the European Society of Cardiology or many other societies around the world, but also foundations, patient organizations. So it's a global platform that engages all these different organizations that have something to do with cardiovascular issues, either from a scientific standpoint, but also from other standpoints that are very relevant to pursue the policies to implement cardiovascular health. So we're very much focusing on advocacy, on global advocacy to improve cardiovascular health uh, for everyone, tackling again uh, this goal to achieve the goal of reducing primitive mortality. We developed an advocacy strategy uh, for uh, the period 2019-2022, and I will give you a little bit more detail on that. And we are very much aligned again with, uh, uh, with WHO and here, uh, one of the meetings uh, that I had with the uh, Director General, Dr. Tedros, aligning strategies uh, together with WHO to ensure that uh, we implement those strategies to, uh, to be efficient and e efficacious in implementation of those global strategies. And in that relation, particularly now uh, in the COVID time, uh, we've been uh, organizing some uh, different uh, uh, projects and different events that uh, together with uh, uh, WHO, uh, we show this type of alignment. And uh, one of them 
has been at the last World Health Assembly in Geneva, last uh, May, June, uh, where uh, we uh, organized together with our colleagues uh, from the Global uh, Circulatory Coalition a statement calling for increased funding and increased integration of circulatory health services, and also some important recommendations, particularly now uh, that uh, we face this pandemic on the relevance to support uh, cardiovascular science and cardiovascular research, particularly when we know that cardiovascular disease was probably the most severely affected uh, collateral damage uh, during the uh, pandemic. And actually, uh, we uh, organized uh, this, uh, uh, this document, uh, which is called The Case for Investing in Circulatory Health. We know today that people living with NCDs were the ones that were at greater risk of severe forms of COVID-19. So not only the ones that infected more easily, but also that had the more severe forms of COVID-19. So there was a devastating, there is still a devastating impact on the millions of people that live with circulatory health problems people with uh, stroke, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, kidney disease, they are at a particularly greater risk uh, from the severe forms of uh, COVID-19 and its consequences. And that's why we, together with our uh, colleagues from the other organizations, uh, developed and organized a position paper that was presented at the WHO. And here we have <coughs> a different set of recommendations Again, uh, focusing on preventing the next pandemic. This is one of uh, uh, the big goals of uh, WHO, which is working very, uh, very hard and very closely with different organizations in terms of developing strategies. And uh, uh, we uh, develop uh, uh, this specifically focusing on cardiovascular issues as a first step to prevent, screen, and treat for circulatory conditions uh, through national COVID 19 response and recovery plans uh, via concerted patient co-creation and collaboration. Secondly, to increase the spending and develop targeted policies to tackle cardiovascular disease and NCD risk factors, including the social and commercial determinants of health. Using revenues from fiscal policies, this is something we've been also working uh, with different countries like taxation for unhealthy commodities such as alcohol and tobacco products. Thirdly, to include indicators on circulatory health and circulatory disease prevalence, comorbidities, risk factors into measures of pandemic readiness, resilience, and response, to ensure that people living with circulatory conditions, and particularly in low resource settings, have good and equitable access to essential health services, including medicine supplies and associated uh, devices through uh, the primary health care, to provide easy priority access to vaccination, and other disease prevention methods for those with underlying circulatory risk factors. And finally, to support and integrate the use of effective new models to deliver quality health services, particularly telemedicine, which has been widely used during this period and is now growing very much in initiatives to support self-care and self-empowerment. We are also very much aligned with the WHO uh, for the, the, the goal of uh, universal uh, health coverage and we are advocating together with WHO as a global uh, priority. And then we are focusing also on other important, uh, particularly uh, relatively new or not so spoken about uh, risk factors and air pollution has been one of them. And actually we organized together with ACC, AJ, ESC, a joint document particularly focusing on air pollution. And we develop our own strategy tackling this, uh, this issue which is relatively unknown for many people, even for decision makers, deaths linked to an outdoor or household air pollution, they represent about 7 million deaths per year and about 54%, so more than half of those are related with the are, are directly linked uh, with the cardiovascular mortality and cardiovascular issues. So we know today that more than 20% of all the cardiovascular disease deaths, they are somehow caused or related uh, uh, with air uh, pollution. And air pollution is therefore a major contributor to the global burden of disease with an estimated 12% of all deaths in the uh, 2019, which represents about close to 7 million people in total, as, uh, as I mentioned. And what is more impressive is the fact that despite uh, we are observing rising deaths due, the, due to air pollution, the impact is felt more strongly in low and middle income countries than in high income countries. So the, 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 the less uh, uh, wealth is somehow uh, wealthy countries 
is somehow a risk factor for being even more effective, more impacted by air pollution. The other area where we've been working also is on what we have called neglected the cardiovascular diseases, mostly focusing on rheumatic heart disease and Chagas disease. Rheumatic heart disease, as we all know, is a preventable, treatable form of cardiovascular disease. We were very happy to see in 2018, following years of advocacy, the unanimous adoption of the global resolution by the World Health Organization on rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease. And this shows again the, uh, the relevance of organizations such as WHF to, uh, through advocacy and lobbying to make sure that these messages get across. And we as WHF are developing several programs and one of them, which I'm, I'm very fond of, is called Colors to Save Hearts. It's actually directed to children, to schools, and then of course, to the teachers, to the, to, to the families, and uh, uh, this is starting now in Mozambique, in Maputo, involving 20 schools, uh, 2,000 children have been screened, uh, and also training of health professionals to uh, going from prevention of uh, rheumatic heart disease to early diagnosis and uh, early treatment, which, as we know, is essential if you want to deal with this condition. I was actually in Maputo just a few weeks ago, end of uh, last year, and I had the opportunity to visit uh, this school and to be with the colleagues there, with the, with the teacher. This is Dr. Anne Mukumbi, the cardiologist in the Kubu, and seeing in real time was even a bit emotional how this is working, how the children are uh, adhering to, uh, to this project. And actually, uh, we were very, uh, very happy to see our efforts recognized. Uh, uh, and this is a movie that we produced with, uh, with BBC, it's called The Bit of Change, Rheumatic Heart Disease, and we were awarded with a special prize on health equity uh, category. And here we have Dr. Anna Mukumi, which has been instrumental at the local level to implement this strategy. Chagas disease, we have this motto, it's trying to break the silence. Chagas disease is probably one of the most neglected diseases. It has received little resources and attention for the health system and governments over the last decade uh, and making it, uh, if you want, the neglected of the neglected. Then with COVID-19, the impact has been uh, tremendous. The pandemic has made a bad situation even worse. Patients, with, particularly with uh, uh, the cardiac involvement, uh, the cardiomyopathy that uh, uh, can, can develop in these patients, they are at a very high risk. There's a potential link between COVID-19, particularly during the period of the cytokine storm and also the development of myocarditis in these patients. Patients with the, uh, the cardiomyopathy disease, they have both biological and social vulnerability, and therefore the need to develop and evaluate novel management approaches, such as telemedicine for people with, uh, with Chagas disease. Uh, it's our goal, uh, a substantial uh, reduction uh, of morbidity and mortality associated with this disease by improving access to quality care, by establishing and supporting, and we're doing that in some countries, national national programs, to improve the diagnosis, treatment, and management of patients uh, who develop Chagas cardiomyopathy, and filling knowledge gaps and working towards more intelligent, evidence-based interventions and informed public health planning, which better serves those affected with Chagas disease. We have been uh, organizing several awareness activities uh, Sam, during the uh, World Chagas Day, which is on the 14th of April, related with Carlos Chagas, the uh, colleague from Brazil, uh, who uh, basically described uh, and discovered the uh, disease. And uh, we developed different activities, uh, organized a, a film, uh, including some patients, uh, some colleagues treating this disease. Uh, and uh, in, the, uh, in the house of Chagas, we had uh, a webinar uh, focusing specifically on this, uh, uh, this topic. So uh, uh, in this group of the neglected cardiac disease, we're developing several activities. Some of them uh, are going to be uh, launched uh, very soon. We are updating the ECHO guidelines on rheumatic heart disease. There's a first publication a couple of years ago. We are re uh, reviewing it and revising it. And uh, we created the group to uh, develop guidelines on ECHO uh, in Chagas disease. And uh, we are also working with uh, different uh, organizations, uh, even universities um, in different parts of the world, particularly in, uh, uh, in South America, which is one of the areas where the prevalence is higher, but also with IHME and the GBD group and so on. So uh, we can uh, tackle this, uh, uh, this disease that affects uh, a significant number of people. 
Then there is a whole work then uh, with, uh, with tobacco. Uh, this is uh, the most prevalent uh, uh, risk factor. And uh, we've been organizing different uh, strategies to uh, focus uh, and to tackle this, uh, uh, this issue. These are just some of the activities that have been, where WHF has been heavily involved in our advocacy team. We have a group just dedicated to, uh, to tobacco. We've been participating in the different uh, meetings, different organizations. Uh, producing different uh, uh, documents uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, providing uh, uh, evidence, evidence-based information, providing uh, all sorts of uh, uh, awareness campaigns and basically working with different organizations to ensure that the messages get uh, across. Very recently, we published a, a paper that had a lot of uh, buzz in the, in the media. This is in the Times. Um, and uh, we, we published this uh, uh, paper on the this policy brief on e-cigarettes. And actually, there is a, an important paper uh, that was co-written also with ACCAJ and DSC precisely on uh, e-cigarettes, uh, which is one of, as we know, one of the issues that, that I think we are all, uh, all facing. <coughs> Another area that uh, we've been also working has to do with uh, nutrition, with food, uh, there is a policy brief on front of uh, uh, pack labeling, uh, what we call healthy choices for healthy uh, people. We've been also working on some uh, more specific areas, like, uh, for instance, uh, with groups that have been uh, working with familial uh, hypercholesterolemia. Uh, there have been uh, a few uh, projects uh, that we've been supporting and being engaged in some of uh, the groups that uh, either at the continental or country or global level. And uh, uh, we were part of uh, some of the reports, some of uh, the papers that have been uh, produced and some of the projects that also have been addressing the decision. Very recently, there was actually an important uh, meeting here in Europe, uh, also facing uh, um, and focusing on an important issue, which is uh, the issue of familiar uh, hypercholesterolemia screening, particularly in children. And uh, we are now in a, in a project uh, which is also uh, approaching governments and, uh, and health structures to develop strategies for early diagnosis of familiar uh, hypercholesterolemia. One of the big areas and one of the big projects already in a few years uh, that uh, we've been developing at WHF are the roadmaps. The roadmaps, they are key reference documents that outline a vision of an ideal pathway of care for cardiovascular disease patients, uh, and at the same time, identifying roadblocks along this pathway and evidence-informed solutions that have been tested in other parts, in other countries, and examples from practice that then can be applied in other regions. The goal here is to assist leaders in cardiovascular health to assess the needs and the gaps in their communities, uh, organize a framework to assess national priority areas along an ideal pathway of patient care, and to identify those roadblocks along the pathway and look toward these examples uh, that can be useful in certain settings in different contexts, which vary, as we know, from region to region, sometimes even within the same country. These are the different topics that uh, we've been dealing with and producing these roadmaps. Uh, we just published uh, a few months ago uh, our last roadmap on hypertension. Last year, we also published uh, the one on atrial fibrillation. And we are working now on two. Uh, one is a, a, an updated one on cholesterol uh, that should be uh, published uh, uh, this year, uh, very soon. And there's another one which is new on, on digital health, which was launched in 2021, and that should be published also uh, uh, this year. Just to give a little bit of a, an idea how this uh, uh, works, these roadmaps, uh, this is an example of the roadmaps on Chagas disease, but many others. Uh, so we assemble an expert group. Then uh, there is a statement of intent, which inclu includes the purpose, uh, the target audience, the scope of the roadmap. Then we draft the roadmap with different sections and content. Survey uh, is organized through the different uh, WHF members. Uh, then there, is, there are stakeholder meetings, uh, and the goal to capture uh, an audience, publication, dissemination, implementation, and that includes national roundtables, educational tools that are provided to uh, all these different uh, users, and then, of course, monitoring and ev evaluation, and then it's time for a uh, review or vision of, uh, uh, of the roadmap, and we're doing this uh, on a regular basis. So it's an integrated approach to patient care, 
including basically everybody involved from patients, uh, carers, patient organizations, civil society, healthcare professionals, and leaders in cardiovascular health, decision and policy makers. All these have to be together if you want to be efficient in our messages. This is the example of the heart failure roadmap. As we all know, the heart failure is a very serious problem that affects more than 36 million people uh, around the world. Mortality rates still remain very high for heart failure patients. And we know today we have that evidence that awareness of symptoms and general public awareness about heart failure can dramatically improve early, di and early detection and diagnosis. And as we all know, early detection and diagnosis means early treatment, and that means better outcome uh, in these patients. It seems so simple, but so difficult to uh, implement. So uh, there is clearly a large scale global effort needed to raise the awareness of heart failure among the general public to improve the early diagnosis and therefore outcomes for patients, to improve adherence to medication among patients, which is a very big issue that we are all facing uh, around the world. Keep in mind in some conditions uh, uh, at one year follow-up, patient, only about uh, some patient, uh, patients, only about 50% of the, of the patients are adherent to the medication that was started with, which is dramatic and then support disease management and uh, integrate with the uh, care models. Heart failure is a good example on how uh, inequality plays a role in terms of outcome. We know already from the pure study that education is a risk factor, or the education level is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Also, uh, uh, income uh, as is a risk factor, uh, and equality on access to medication and to uh, resources is a risk factor. And that's clearly shown here, this Gini uh, coefficient uh, indicates uh, the, uh, the relation uh, between outcome and ec uh, equality access to uh, treatment, to management. And it shows clear if you divide in third tiles that there has a major impact in primary uh, outcome in heart failure hospitalization, all cause death, cardiovascular death. And actually this, uh, uh, this study that was done um, using a meta-analysis of three important studies in heart failure, uh, they showed that the high inequality and low income was one of the most important risk factors to play in outcome in patients uh, with heart failure. Here we have um, the global map of the most common causes of heart failure around the world, and there are some differences, and this is very important because uh, we cannot apply the same recipe uh, uh, in everywhere. We have to know the reality, and that's why it's so important to have good data and to know uh, and the landscape in different parts of the world so we can apply uh, the proper recipe in those, uh, uh, in those different uh, parts of the world. And then it's, uh, uh, it's basically an exercise of organizing the different roadblocks, uh, roadblocks identifying those roadblocks, either on prevention, on diagnosis, identify them uh, and uh, indicate potential solutions, and also on the, uh, treatment. I will not go through the details, but basically in these documents, uh, this identification of the roadblocks and then the uh, inclusion of potential solutions that then are worked out at the local level uh, to improve implementation, particularly implementation of guidelines, which as we all know very well, it's still a big issue that we face as a, as a medical community and as a community as a whole, how we can implement guidelines that we know work, we know guidelines save lives. So basically these roadmaps, uh, they are um, uh, identifying what should be the ideal pathway uh, to, in this case, for heart failure patients, but for any conditions and the roadblocks that can that are identified along the way and how to overcome those uh, roadblocks. There is a whole program uh, first uh, that we then uh, organize with our members in different parts of the world. Uh, uh, we organize some facilitation of national stakeholder discussions uh, through roundtables, facilitation of uh, developing national scorecards, planning and research of evidence-informed solutions by creating a global network and also providing a toolkit for implementation uh, of uh, uh, different uh, uh, solutions. Um, and then very importantly, we work with patient organizations and patient voices are heard more and more. Uh, the co-creation of uh, these projects with involvement of patients, it's now appreciated as uh, very relevant if you want to be meaningful and if we want to have a real impact on patients' lives. And this is just uh, some, uh, some examples. 
Then we have organized these different world maps for the different conditions that I've shown you. And this is the example of Chagas again, who are the people at risk, how to do the screening, the, how to do the diagnosis, classification, treatment and management follow-up. And all of this is integrated into this model that I just uh, uh, described. And then we organize all these different programs, what we call cardiovascular disease solutions, moving from global to local. And this is why we organized through a program that uh, uh, we uh, started uh, um, a few years ago, it was actually my uh, predecessor, uh, Salim Yusuf, that uh, organized the first program called the Emerging Leaders Program, where through a topic, usually related with the most uh, recent uh, uh, roadmap, uh, it organizes uh, this gathering of uh, 25 emerging leaders uh, to uh, around that topic and then develop uh, uh, some uh, um, programs, usually three projects. Uh, there is some, uh, some support for that. There are three projects that are organized in each one of these uh, uh, different emerging leaders program. Uh, we had this one uh, here, for instance, uh, on diabetes, this one on hypertension, and also organized, uh, uh, this is an example where it was organized in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, which, by the way, is a very good example on how these uh, roadmaps had a major impact on the early diagnosis, identification, and treatment and monitoring of that treatment in hypertensive uh, patients, which, as we know, is one of the big issues that uh, we are facing in lipid management, um, in heart failure, this uh, was uh, uh, done in England. And very recently, the last one uh, in patients with cardiovascular disease and diabetes was actually here in my uh, university hospital. This is the group that was still able to come. Uh, 11 out of 25, they were able to travel here to Lisbon. And we had a very nice program here uh, with this, uh, uh, with this uh, somewhere here, somewhere remotely. Uh, but uh, we organize a very nice program with three projects that now are uh, underway. Another important project that started during my, uh, uh, my board, my, uh, my term, is uh, uh, the World Heart Observatory. And the goal here is to provide a central hub for access to high quality data on cardiovascular health, which is collated from our partners, from our members, from our international uh, data sources together uh, in this hub. As we all agree, uh, accurate, timely, accessible data is a game changer in the fight against, I would say, any disease, but of course we are focusing on cardiovascular disease. We also know that there are multiple valuable data initiatives in the non-communicable and cardiovascular disease space and in our network. And here we have uh, uh, some examples. And for instance, in, uh, in the US, HCC, AJ, they have uh, fantastic uh, registries. Uh, but uh, we felt there was a need to collate and curate uh, uh, some of uh, uh, these initiatives uh, at the, to have a global uh, perspective and also to transform this data uh, into actionable uh, knowledge. And these are just some of the examples of different uh, types of data collection, uh, which is done by uh, many of our members, also different initiatives, Pure uh, Interaspire, many others, that we are working with, and of course, the WHO and GBD group, uh, which are our partners. So uh, uh, the goal here was really to, uh, to map, to collate, and to create all these different initiatives uh, and launch this, organize uh, this uh, observatory as an open access website. Uh, and we've been working uh, on this over the last year. Um, the goal is, again, to organize this data and then to generate data reports that can be used for advocacy, for communication purposes. Very importantly, we are not only focusing on, on uh, demographics or uh, on prevalence of disease. We are also focusing on, on many other issues related with cardiovascular health, with systems, with health systems. Uh, and uh, one of the goals is to identify the gaps and also the research needs uh, um, at, the, at the global, regional, uh, continental. Uh, so it's, we believe it's very uh, important uh, to do that. Of course, some areas will be in more need than others. That's obvious. But this is certainly one of our goals. And then basically to develop capacity on cardiovascular data collection uh, among our members. And it's been very uh, grateful to see, I'm very grateful and very gratifying to see the adherence from uh, our members. We've had 
these discussions and this engagement uh, uh, with, uh, uh, particularly with our uh, members who have already strong uh, uh, registry and, and the data collection capacities. And it's really been very, very useful and very productive. Of course, our audiences are going to be wide, our members, but also policymakers, the academic and research community, the civil society, but also the uh, private sector. So, and of course, uh, the impact uh, is again to develop uh, informed uh, evidence-based decision-making for health at the population level, to build data capacity among uh, cardiac health organizations and create basically a forum for research and debate uh, for cardiovascular health. We are organizing, we signed an agreement with IHME, we're gonna use their uh, matrix of uh, a website. We believe it's a very, uh, it's a very flexible uh, uh, website that allows us to uh, have the data in a way that then can be retrieved by uh, the users according with the needs of uh, those users of the audience that uh, uh, I just alluded to. And we're gonna have the official launch. I'm gonna be in Geneva, it's gonna be a virtual event, but I'm gonna be in Geneva where we're gonna do the virtual uh, launch on the 1st of February, uh, unveiling this World Heart Observatory. So we're very much looking forward to have this as one of our main accomplishments for, for this mandate. Well, uh, we also do uh, have a science committee it's chaired by Dr. Prabhakar from, uh, from India. There are some uh, studies that have been organized. One of them more visible is the uh, COVID study, uh, which is basically the WHF Global COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease study. The goal here was to identify cardiovascular risk factors associated with the poor in hospital prognosis among patients with COVID-19 to describe kind of outcomes among patients hospitalized with COVID-19. It's an observational cohort study, which includes uh, consecutive confirmed adult uh, COVID-19 patients. Each center that recruited between 50 to 200 to 500 consecutive patients. And then together it was used using this electronic form, the, the uh, red cap. And what is uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, here is that we uh, included uh, several countries, uh, some from Europe and the US, but also many countries and many centers from low and middle uh, income countries. That was also uh, uh, the goal of our uh, study was to involve, because many of the studies that we see today, many, as we know, uh, thousands of studies have been published over these last couple of years, but most of them, they came either from the US or from Europe. We wanted to have a larger uh, 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 group of uh, countries uh, involved here this just gives you a little bit of a summary of uh, the data. Again, I will not bother you with all the details, but it shows that about 60% of the hospitals were public. We have also private hospitals and community uh, hospitals. Just some of the uh, demographics, uh, they're very similar to, interestingly, to, uh, uh, with uh, what has been observed. But it's, it's very interesting to see some of the results here. Of course, comorbidities, they were present in a high percentage of patients. You can see here, Hypertension, almost 50% of the patients, and diabetes, uh, uh, about uh, a third of the patients. Uh, the clinical uh, outcomes, and uh, what is relevant here uh, was that uh, there was a median length of hospital stay of about nine days, and about uh, uh, um, in hospital mortality was about 13%. In the 30 day mortality, so we did a follow up for this study of 30 days, the overall Death up to 30 days was about was uh, about 15 uh, percent of uh, of the patients. These are just some of the factors associated with all cause mortality. They were age related, the gender related. There was some uh, relation with some uh, ethnicity, and here we can see and this is why it's important. This study, the uh, relation uh, with uh, low and middle uh, income countries having uh, worse prognosis. So the next step for the study, we are continuing. And now we are looking at long COVID uh, and we just got support um, for this study, which uh, will is now uh, starting uh, to look at this problem, which is uh, long COVID. We also have um, specific, developed specific uh, response uh, during COVID, uh, organizing a resource hub for COVID-19, uh, organizing some of the guidelines for also for patients, not only for professionals, but also for, uh, for patients. Uh, and organized this blog, The Heart in the Time of COVID-19, that uh, our emerging leaders, they were very active in uh, organizing this, uh, uh, this, uh, this blog, collecting the latest science on COVID-19 cardiovascular disease. This is all openly available in our website. 
And in terms of global uh, advocacy, we have called on governments to work uh, collaboratively with WHO and implement the WHO's resolutions uh, on COVID-19. These are just some examples of the responses that uh, we have with, uh, with this project. A couple of other projects, just to, uh, to show you um, a couple of more initiatives. This is called the World Heart Health 2030. So the objective here is to focus on what are the current and anticipated transformational changes and trends in the global healthcare environment to address uh, some of the strategic challenges that the cardiovascular health community will face over the next decade. Things changed. Review the opportunities offered by digital health, by telemedicine, by mRNA-based treatments. As we all know, uh, mRNA techniques they are not new. Uh, people are now very much uh, uh, knowing about this because of the vaccine, but this is a technique that has been used for quite a while, imaging and so on. And the goal here is to propose ways in which the challenges can be turned into opportunities and also to consider some strategies to integrate cardiovascular health more effectively in policy, in policy uh, initiatives. Uh, our expected outcomes is to outline how the cardiovascular health community can tackle challenges and seize opportunities to help to guide policy and advocacy efforts for the next decade, to identify also future projects and WHF initiatives to be developed, and to feed our summit. I will talk a little bit about it. Our summit, we are uh, organizing something like uh, Davos, like uh, summit uh, for cardiovascular uh, issues, and uh, uh, we're going to use all this information during that uh, uh, that summit. There have been many publications that WHF has been producing. This is just a few of them that were published in 2021. Many of them, together with our strategic partners like the uh, ACC, AAJ, ESC, and uh, on, and I've shown you a few examples like air pollution and uh, e-cigarettes. Um, also um, on the healthcare force and uh, on well-being of healthcare force, which is, as we know, a very important issue right now. And finally, just a word on the, uh, what is uh, one of our uh, probably more visible activity, which is the World Heart Day. This started a few years ago. Uh, this year, we focused on how digital health can help us beat cardiovascular disease. We use this motto of use heart to beat cardiovascular disease or to beat the broken heart, if you uh, if you will. And it's not only Takasu. And, uh, and, and there were key messages that uh, we organized around this uh, World Heart Day, which is now is on the 29th of September uh, every year. Uh, and as I mentioned, there were, uh, uh, we focused this year, on the, uh, this year, I mean 2021, on digital health. And there were three specific territories that we, uh, we, uh, we looked at. Equity, put health at the heart of digital transformation, prevention, raising awareness and reducing risk factors. And finally, community, connecting or reconnecting people living with cardiovascular disease, so relevant, particularly now in the period of the pandemic, uh, this problem of, uh, um, of connection of people. These are just some of the numbers that uh, uh, we had. We very, this is a program that is, uh, uh, is organized by our team together with the professional organization. And it's been very reaching out basically all over the world. Just give you a few examples. It's actually in my hospital where we celebrated the World Heart Day. I was actually in Geneva. This is the University Hospital in, uh, in Geneva. This is the Ministry of Health of uh, uh, the Geneva Canton and, and the head of the hospital. We had organized a, a, a big event here with our colleagues from uh, from cardiovascular uh, uh, department. And we had, uh, who knows Geneva, knows this bridge, this is the Mont Blanc Bridge. And we had uh, this campaign with our flags, with the World Health Federation and the, and the, uh, the World Heart Day flags again, raising awareness on cardiovascular issues. This, this was there for uh, one week and we liked it. Uh, this is the Jeu de, the, the Jeu de, which is a iconic symbol in, the, in Geneva, in the Geneva Lake. We highlighted this in red, and then uh, it's a iconic uh, thing to highlight different monuments around the world. Um, and uh, many of them uh, are very uh, famous ones. And uh, uh, we have here, of course, the collaboration of uh, our members around, uh, around the world. And this is a very relevant initiative, very visible. And what we, uh, what we do is not only uh, have the uh, activity on the 29th of September, but then have a whole set of different activities throughout the year. So the message gets across not only on a single, a single day. 
And finally, uh, uh, the World Congress of Cardiology, which changed the model totally a few years ago. Um, we had, uh, we used to have a standalone meeting that uh, uh, is not the model now. Now the model is to organize it together with one of our members. Uh, we had the first one was actually in 2019 with the ESC in Paris. Then we had the one with ACC that had to be converted into a virtual one, as well as the one with, uh, uh, with Japan in 2021. And in 2022, we hope, we're planning now for a hybrid meeting. We hope to be able to have it with a significant number of colleagues present uh, and physical presence. And uh, of course, you all invited the ones uh, and that would like to be there. It's in Rio de Janeiro, and I see it to be in, and it's going to be in October, the 12th to 15th, October 2022. Well, and now I just finish uh, with uh, uh, my team, uh, the WHF team. It's not a big organization, but this is the core team uh, in Geneva. Uh, this is doing the World Heart Day. This is our CEO and the, our uh, directors uh, that are responsible from different areas, and many of the things that I showed you is the work that they are doing. And finally, of course, I couldn't uh, finish without Again, thanking uh, Bill. Bill is a good friend for many years. We've been involved in many things together. I just uh, brought uh, two of the pictures that we have together in two different parts of the world, uh, in Rio and Moscow, uh, always with friends. Unfortunately, some of them, they are not with us anymore. And I just uh, remember here, Joe Roland, who passed away a couple of years ago. He was a big figure in the, in the echo field. This is actually at the Kremlin in Moscow, where we had a very... Very nice, uh, uh, very nice time. And uh, again, it's been my privilege to be here uh, talking to you, addressing you. It's a honor. I really appreciate it. And I thank you whole, uh, wholeheartedly, Bill, for this invitation. And I'm more than happy now to uh, answer any questions and have any additional comments or information that you feel can be relevant. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fausto, for uh, really a, a great overview of not only what the World Heart Federation is doing and what you're doing uh, you know, with your team, but also to put a focus on the global burden of disease, particularly in cardiovascular disease. And, um, and this, is a, this is a big issue. Uh, I, I welcome comments and uh, you know, questions from the audience, and you, ha you know how to, how to do that on the web or texting. But I will start with one, uh, uh, Fausto. Um, the question is, you know, we, we know what the burden of disease is, and we know it is regional. You know, I mean, in the Western countries, maybe a little, still a burden, but, you know, we're managing it in ways. Uh, maybe there is more availability of medications than others. Uh, how can you, how can we, all of us, World Heart Federation, you know, United Nations, World Health Organization, be more effective at the local level, because obviously it's a, it's a local level uh, issues. And uh, maybe conceivably with hypertension being the low hanging fruit, partnering maybe with industry to have, you know, a poly pill or other things that you may have on your mind that we can be a little more effective on the ground in addition to highlighting the major issues in various countries. And I love the observatory that you have in partnership with the IG. So you can have a f actually a feel of, in the various locales, how, how big is the burden of disease. So maybe some of your thoughts of, of some of these challenges that you're facing. Well, thank you very much, Bill. And uh, that's, of course, the, uh, the big question that uh, we all facing, and that's the big challenge. And, uh, and actually, uh, as we know, the, uh, the problem that we currently have in managing the cardiovascular disease, it's a global problem. Uh, and you, you may have it more, uh, let's say, in a more visible way, uh, sometimes even within the same country with inequalities and uh, inequalities of access, uh, inequalities of education. Uh, and that has been already uh, demonstrated by different, uh, different studies, different uh, registries, different observational uh, um, studies, like the Pew study, for instance, that show that even within the same country you can have that. So the question here is, you know, what sort of uh, uh, methods, what sort of attitude, what sort of uh, strategies uh, can we uh, implement that can be successful? And uh, one good example, as you mentioned, uh, is hypertension. And as you know, uh, WHO, 
just published, uh, it's actually the first time in 20 years that WHO publishes guidelines in hypertension. And hypertension is a very good example because, you know, it seems relatively simple to detect, just measure the blood pressure. We have good medication for uh, uh, to uh, at least to treat the majority of patients uh, who are uh, with uh, uh, diagnosed with hypertension, but we, it's been a failure. We only detect about one third of the patients. Uh, in in those detected, we only treat about one third. In those treated, we only um, have about one third who are uh, controlled. So, how to improve that? And different strategies have been um, now thought of because you know this is nothing new um, but we have not been successful at implementing strategies to tackle this if if, if you want to be um, efficient uh, on the way we do it so there are some things that are being now um, put in place and some things that are being tried and some things that we still have to see how efficient they will be in practice because sometimes you may have a very good idea but then in practice, it may not work. It's like medication, you know. It only works if, if you take them. And we know adherence to treatment is a big issue that, uh, that we are facing. So some of these strategies, one of them you mentioned already, and that's actually in the guidelines for hypertension, and that can be applied to other conditions. And it's about uh, polypill or fixed dose combination, if you will. So fixed dose combination now uh, is a strategy that has been shown, and there is recent data showing that it can actually have a significant impact on outcome. It can have a significant impact also in terms of patient adherence, which of course reflects on patient outcome. So that's certainly one of the strategies that is now starting to be implemented. We're working also with WHO to align those dissemination of those recommendations and that strategy. There is another important um, recommendation, which, some, which is a bit sensitive, but which I think uh, uh, is something that we really have to discuss and, uh, and it's time, particularly in some regions, to be even more aggressive on the way we, we do it. It's about task shifting. It's about using other health professionals. We live in a world of multidisciplinarity, uh, of uh, uh, having uh, multiple approaches, of uh, having uh, multiple uh, competencies and skills involved in patient management and of course in the hospitals we are used to that on this multidisciplinarity of complex patients and uh, involving different specialties different groups and so on but we have to do that also in simple things such as treating hypertension which is not so simple as we see so test shifting by using uh, different uh, pr different professionals and even different people to help to identify even to diagnose and even to make sure that people take the right medication, uh, it's becoming a very important issue. In some countries that has been done already for some time, UK is a good example on the, the role of uh, nurses and the role of some other health professionals. And, and that is actually something that, that we really have uh, to face and to look at very, uh, very carefully. Uh, we, we, we have that study from the US on, uh, on barbershops and, uh, and hypertension uh, treatment. As you know, it was a very interesting and very successful study showing that uh, the barbers, the relevance of barbershops to, uh, and to, uh, to, to manage and, uh, and to ensure a, a continuation of treatment of uh, the hypertension patient and even for identification of, uh, of high blood pressure. So it's simple things, but that can uh, can be if they are done, we have to think about them and then uh, uh, implement them. Of course, we have now a big tool, which actually uh, had a big push over these last uh, couple of years. We already had it, but which is the whole thing around digital health. I think I believe digital health uh, is a global term, of course, and it goes from very simple things like the Apple Watch, the very complex monitoring, the remote monitoring, and even remote treatment, and so on. But um, the use of digital health, I'm very much convinced, if done properly, can be a very relevant tool to improve the way we do, not only patient management, of course, but health, to disseminate messages of positive messages about the good, uh, optimal, lifestyle uh, examples monitoring here from exercise to nutrition to activities to many other things. even just like you know a, a psychological life you know there are many things now that are being used 
uh, in these different approaches on digital health. And I, I do think that's something that, uh, and, and that's why we have this roadmap on digital health uh, to look at, uh, at this specific uh, uh, model and, and this specific uh, huge tool. But then what is interesting is if, if, you, if you look at some parts of the world, particularly in low and middle income countries, sometimes there are simple things that again, can be uh, introduced, can be helped, can be reminded. Um, and by siding with, the, that's why we have this work of siding and working with our members at the local level. Because no one, no one else than local people, local colleagues, local organizations, know what are the problems and how to implement better uh, strategies that can fit. Because sometimes there are cultural things, there are uh, uh, different aspects that have to be taken into account if we want to be successful. And that's the thing, you know, we want to be successful. We have, there is a, a study from Eurostat just a year ago or so that showed something which is amazing. And we are talking about uh, OECD countries. So most of them, you know, high income countries. If we apply today what we know today, not even thinking about innovation and new treatments and new drugs or new devices, but what we know today, we could save one out of three deaths in the OECD countries. And about two thirds of those deaths will be in the cardiovascular system. That this is, is so amazing. true. That, that is so true, Fausto, because, because I mean, you know, the, among the risk factors, hypertension <clears throat> is the low-hanging fruit. And we have rather very affordable medications nowadays. It's just along the lines of what you mentioned, some of these strategies would be very important to be able to do that globally. Another thing that, <clears throat> that I know I'm very proud also of the World Heart Federation that has done with, with Salim Youssef and, and many of the, uh, you know, leaders is the forum for training you know future leaders that are local leaders in the countries where where uh, you know the activity is and and you need champions you need champions at the local level that are involved with governments that are involved with healthcare for policies for administration and i think this is this would be very important and it dovetails very nicely with the question that we've just had Thank you for an excellent presentation, Dr. Pinto. How can trainee and early career cardiologists or U.S. cardiologists, irrespective, here or somewhere, become involved in these noble global health initiatives? That's a fantastic question, and uh, you are actually all invited <laughs> to, uh, uh, to, to, to work with us. It's actually been fantastic, Bill, uh, uh, as uh, we are not so young anymore. We are still young, but not so young anymore. But it's so good to see the younger generations so uh, so much open, so much generous, uh, altruistic uh, to uh, um, work and to give their time and uh, and work towards uh, uh, all these different uh, projects and many others, of course, many other organizations doing. And that's so gratifying to see the the, the younger generations involved. But it's very simple. Uh, and, well, of course, we have our website, and in our website, you have all the information and all the contacts. And, and we are actually always looking for new colleagues, new members to be uh, engaged with us. Uh, we have several of these activities ongoing, uh, many others being planned. Uh, we're always looking for new, uh, and particularly from the younger generations, to be involved with us. Um, and uh, we are very much uh, hopeful that, uh, and, and actually it's been very gratifying to, uh, to, to see that, because there's a lot of work that can be done and, and that can help us in a way to implement all these different things that we are doing. And also, it's very important to have this across the globe, because again, as I mentioned, it's very important that some of these initiatives to be implemented, that we need to have local support and we have local teams doing, uh, doing that. So please join us. Uh, our website is open, uh, it's open access, and uh, you have there all the information. If you, if you use the emerging leaders uh, 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 password or the, the, the this word in you, is the, you will have access to all this information. You can always, uh, of course, contact me uh, directly. I'm very easy to find. Uh, so uh, we're more than happy to have you uh, joining us. And again, uh, we're very much looking forward for uh, the involvement of uh, the younger generation. You are the future. And, uh, uh, we certainly need, and we very, uh, it's, it's very good to see uh, the bright 
young uh, new uh, future leaders uh, starting uh, being engaged in all these different activities because it's new blood, new ideas, and it's from these uh, new generations that uh, we have to look with a, with a smile into, uh, into the future. Well, on this uplifting and motivating note, <laughs> uh, it's really nice to see that. Thank you, uh, thank you, Fausto, for an amazing lecture. Thank you for your leadership uh, to, to carry forward you know, our mission, which is to improve health globally. And uh, thanks for everything. And look forward sometime to seeing you in Houston or in Lisbon and reconnecting face to face. All the best. Absolutely. All the Thank best. you so much, Phil. Thank it was you. a pleasure.